Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If I sound a little bit different today, it's because I've just moved house. Everything is in boxes and I don't have any soundproofing in my studio. Also, I'm completely exhausted, but I thought it would be fun to talk about moving house in space. Now, obviously, space stations move. I'm not going to be that cheap. No, there was actually a case where astronauts, or rather cosmonauts, went to one space station, picked up a bunch of stuff, and moved it to their new digs, their new space station. And this happened between Salyut 7 and Mir. But the way we get to this uh, set of circumstances is actually pretty complicated. Salyut 7 was the last of the single-module space stations that was flown by the Soviet Union. And in 1985, it had some technical problems that led to the space station losing orientation and essentially drifting. And thanks to amazing work by the badass cosmonauts across aboard Soyuz T-13, they were able to dock with the rotating station and eventually repair it and restore it to power. This has actually turned into a movie last year. Now, after that, the space station continued to be operated. A new crew flew up in Soyuz T-14 in September of 1985, and they also received a new shipment of experiments via a spacecraft called Cosmos 1686. This was a TKS spacecraft, which you may not have heard of, but it was actually derived from the VA crew launch vehicle that was supposed to fly on the Proton rocket as part of a, a moon mission plan. It never turned into an actual crew capsule because there were some concerns about launching crew on board a spacecraft fueled with hideously toxic hypergolic propellants. The VA capsule looked a lot more like the US capsules. It was a conical shape. And it also was mated to a service module. There was actually a service module on top of it, which provided a lot of the on-orbit propulsion. But in the TKS spacecraft, it would be mated with something called the functional cargo block, which was essentially a space station module. And the crew was supposed to go through a hatch into this module, and they would do all sorts of you know, crew experiment things. It was actually very similar to the Gemini manned orbiting laboratory concept. But the cargo block that was used in this, that actually became the kind of prototype, the basis for all the future Mir modules and actually the Zarya module on the ISS and the Nauka module if they ever get around to launching that. Anyway, in the case of Cosmos 1686, the VIA capsule was stripped down and it was replaced with a bunch of uh, sensor gear. So Soyuz T-14, they went up for a couple of months, but then they had to cut short their stay on uh, Salyut 7 because the mission commander, Vladimir Vasyutin, he became gravely ill with uh, some sort of infection that was causing him to have a fever. And he, they, they came home early, but they left a whole bunch of their experiments undone. And there was a real chance that those would be abandoned because... They were already looking forward to the Mir space station, and they really wanted to launch Mir in February 1986, timing it to coincide with the 27th Communist Party Congress. And this new generation of space station was also designed to work with a new generation of Soyuz spacecraft, the TM series. The problem was that while the space station was ready to launch on time, the TM was still in development. So the Soviet space people, they came up with a crazy plan. They would make one more Soyuz T mission. And using this, the crew would visit both space stations on a single mission. The crew would be Leonid Kizim and Vladimir Solovyev, who both knew Salyut 7 pretty well. The, the Soyuz actually had to be assembled in part from you know, the spare pieces they had sitting around. Now, according to Anatoly Zak of Russia Space Web, the descent module in particular was actually reused from a launch failure in September 83. This was where the booster caught fire and the launch escape system carried the crew away safely. That was reflown as part of this mission. Now, to make it possible for the same spacecraft to visit both space stations, they would have to be in the same orbital plane, not just the same orbital inclination, but they had to also get the launch window at the right time. So Mir was launched on uh, February 20th into the same orbital plane as Salyut 7, and then once it was in orbit for a couple of weeks, Soyuz T-15 was launched on March 13th, and it made a slow rendezvous to Mir. It took about 50 hours in part because they were intentionally trying to conserve fuel for the multiple operations they would have to do in orbit. 
The actual docking was kind of complicated because Mir had been designed to work with the new Soyuz, which wasn't yet available, and it had a new navigation system called Curs. The old navigation system was called Igla, and it was still used on the Progress spacecraft, but it was only available on the aft docking port. So the crew would use the automated system to approach the aft docking port, and then when they got close, they then took over manual control and flew around the space station and manually docked in the front port. And then they spent six weeks activating Mir, bringing its systems online, checking everything out and beginning to plan their trip to Salyut 7. In the meantime, however, there had been a technical issue which had essentially rendered Salyut 7 unable to manoeuvre. They'd sent a command, all their thrusters had got jammed, and the only control they had was the TKS spacecraft, which was still docked to it. And it wasn't a rendezvous as we would think about it. it they didn't just jump into the Soyuz and fly from one space station to another. Most of the manoeuvring to get them close and into the right orbit was actually performed by Mir. Mir used the thrusters on the visiting Progress cargo spacecraft to maneuver. That meant that the Soyuz didn't have to use any of its very limited supply of fuel. That fuel would be required for the three rendezvous and the D orbit. So Mir went and performed a number of orbit raising and lowering maneuvers to make sure that its orbital planes were inclined and to get as close as possible to Salyut 7. Then the crew jumped into their Soyuz and they crossed the distance. It took them about 29 hours to cross that. And because of the technical problems with Salyut, I believe the docking was also manual. Once there, they tried to fix the technical issues as best they could to make sure that Cosmos would perform all the manoeuvring that was needed. And then they settled in for about six weeks of doing the experiments that had been left behind. Some of these were simply things that had been left that had to be uh, recovered and packaged up for return. Others included uh, going on an EVA and testing out a deployable girder, like a truss segment that would... Uh, like telescope out. They performed welding experiments in space. And finally, when their time was up, they were getting ready to shut down Salute for what would turn out to be the last time. They packed up all the useful equipment which had been left behind. Now, I would love to know more detail about what exactly they brought. I'm told it's 360 kilograms of cargo. They uh, got a multi-channel spectrometer, according to one account, and, and someone else said that they had a guitar that they brought with them. I think it's pretty safe to say that most of the stuff they're moving had big fragile stickers slapped all over them, but on the other hand, they didn't have to worry about dropping them. Again, for the return journey, Mir had performed a number of orbital maneuvers to bring it into the best position for a rendezvous, so that when they undocked, it took another 29 hours on a fuel-conserving trajectory to bring them back to Mir, where again they had to perform this manual approach and docking. And then they unloaded their cargo, becoming the world's first space-moving people. And the good news was that Mir was really only a single module at that time, so they couldn't put any of the boxes in the wrong room. They couldn't say hypothetically put that cooler of frozen food in the downstairs bathroom where the owner would completely miss it for three days. Once they were back at Mir, there wasn't actually that much left for them to do. Originally, it had been planned that a new module would have been launched and they would handle the docking and unloading and integration of that, but it ended up delayed. So as a result, they spent a few weeks observing the Earth before coming home early. The expansion and building out of Mir as a space station would be handled by future crews. As for Salyut 7, well, it was boosted into a storage orbit using the Cosmos spacecraft, with the intention that that would give it them enough time to figure out what to do with it. But ultimately, nobody returned to it to perform new experiments. Mir was the new hotness. They didn't want to deal with the old and busted. There were some suggestions that they would be able to pick this up and return it to Earth in the cargo bay of the Buran shuttle. And that obviously didn't work out either. And so the tenuous outer atmosphere of Earth caused its orbit to slowly decay. And eventually, about 55 months later, it fell into the atmosphere over South America in 1991. Thankfully, that fate cannot befall my old house. However, it does need some foundation work. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.